Hello everybody, happy Friday. Um, I hope that you guys had a really nice day, just like I had. I've done lots of different things. Today, Noah was finally allowed to take his cast off, so we've been to the hospital and we had to wait in line for a long time. The lines were just as long as at the supermarket. We had to keep a distance and everybody was kind of really a little bit grumpy and stuff. But the doctor was really nice, so he's got finally his cast in the bin. And uh, he's still a little bit stiff in his wrist, but uh, I'm sure that it'll be fine when you guys see him again. Um, we're going to continue reading The Brother's Lion Hat. Hello, first person, whoever you are. And um, it's so nice to see that there are quite a few people that are not even in year three um, starting to listen as well. So who knows where this will end at the end. Um, I promise that at the end of the story, if you've got any questions or any things to say that you've commented on or that I haven't responded to when you were commenting, I will respond to that at the end of the story. Um, Ms. Shin has been really busy as well at work. She's been doing a big tidy up in her room. She's been kind of sorting things out. I guess this is a time that everybody is just tidying up and cleaning and making everything ready for the winter. So in a way, it's a really good way to spend your lockdown, isn't it? Now, chapter seven, Carl found all his courage to go and follow Jonathan into the mountains and he had discovered, or so he thought, that Hubert, who came sneaking into the stable, might be the traitor. We're going to find out if this is really true. I told Fiala what it felt like to be me, just me, out on a long ride in the mountains. Do you realize what an adventure this is for me? Remember that I've done nothing but lie on a sofa bed nearly all my life. You mustn't think that I forget Jonathan for one single minute, but otherwise I'd shout so that it rang over the mountains just because this is so wonderful. Yes, it was wonderful. Jonathan would understand that I thought that because what mountains just imagine that such high ones exist that so many little lakes and rushing streams and waterfalls and meadows full of spring flowers existed, right up in the mountains. And there I was, Rusky, on my horse, seeing it all. I didn't know that anything in the world could be so beautiful, so at first I was quite dizzy. Gradually it changed. I had found a little bridle path, probably the one Jonathan had told me about. Round twists and turns, that's how you get to Wildrose Valley, he had said. Twist and turns, they certainly were, that's a fact. Soon I had twisted and turned my way away from the meadows and the mountains became wilder and more and more terrible and the path more and more dangerous to move along. Sometimes it climbed steeply, sometimes it plunged down, sometimes it wound its way along narrow rock shelves alongside huge precipices, and then I thought I would never manage. But Fjallar must have been very used to making his way along dangerous mountain paths. Yes, he was fine, Fjallar was. Towards evening, we were tired, both I and my horse. So then I made a camp for the night on a little green patch where Fjallar could graze close to a stream where we could both drink. Then I made a campfire. All my life I had longed to be able to sit by a campfire because Jonathan had told me how wonderful that was and now at last I was. Now Rusky, at last you'll know what it feels like, I said out loud to myself. I collected up some dry branches and twigs into a large heap and lit a bonfire, which burned and crackled so that the sparks flew all around. And I sat by my fire and felt that it was exactly as Jonathan had said. It felt wonderful as I sat there, looking into the flames, eating my bread and chewing on my smoked meat that was so delicious that I only wished I'd been given the meat by someone other than Hubert. I was happy and sang to myself a little in my solitude. My bread and my fire and my horse. My bread and my fire and my horse. I couldn't think of anything else. I sat like that for a long time and I thought of all the campfires that had burned in all the wildernesses of the world since the beginning of time and how they had all gone out long ago. But mine was burning here and now. It grew dark around me. 
The mountains grew so black. Oh, how dark it became and how quickly it happened. It didn't, I didn't like having my back to all the darkness. It felt as if someone might come at me from behind. Anyhow, it was time to sleep now. So I stoked up the fire well and said good night to Fiala and rolled myself up in my blanket as close to the fire as I could get. And then I wished I could just fall asleep at once before I could frighten myself. Yes, I could frighten myself only too quickly. I don't know anyone who can do that so quickly as I can. My thoughts just begin to grind around in my head and there was sure to be someone lurking out there in the darkness and tangled soldiers and spies were sure to be seething all over the mountains. Even Jonathan was sure to be dead a long time ago. That was how my thoughts would ground on and I didn't sleep. Just then, the moon rose be behind the mountain peak. Well, it probably wasn't the ordinary moon, I suppose. But it looked just the same, and the moonlight was such that I had never seen before. But then, I'd never seen moonlight over high mountains before. Everything became so strange. You were in a mysterious world of nothing but silver and black shadows. It was beautiful, and a little melancholy in a lovely, strange way, but creepy too. For although it was light where the moon shone, among the shadows numerous dangers might be hiding. I pulled the blanket over my head. I didn't want to look anymore. But then I heard instead. Yes, I heard something. A howl far away in the mountains and then several howls a little closer. Fiala whinnied. <laughs> he was afraid. And then I realized what it was. Wolves howling. Someone as timid as I am could easily have died of fright. But when I noticed how anxious Fiala was, I tried to put a brave face on it. Fiala, wolves are afraid of fire, didn't you know? I said. But I didn't really believe it myself. And the wolves had never heard it either, because now I could see them. They were coming closer. Horrible grey shapes which came streaking out into the moonlight, howling with hunger. And then... I howled too. I shouted to high heaven. Never have I left such a shout. And that frightened them a little bit, I think, but not for long. Soon they were back again, even closer this time. Their howls made Fiala quite wild. And me too. I knew we were going to die now, both of us. I should be used to that. I had already died once, but then... I had wanted to die that time, then I had longed to, and now I didn't want to. Now I wanted to live, and I wanted to be with Jonathan. Oh, Jonathan, if only you could come and help me. They were close now, the wolves. One was larger than the others and more insolent, probably the leader wolf. He was the one who could get me. I knew it. He circled round me and howled, howled, so that my blood froze. I threw a burning branch at him and I shouted loudly, but that just annoyed him. I saw his open jaws, his terrible teeth that were longing to get at my throat. Now, Jonathan, help! Now, he's sleeping! But then, what in the world happened then? In the middle of his leap, he gave a yelp and fell down at my feet. Dead, stone dead, and straight through his head was an arrow. From what bow did that arrow come? Who was it who had saved my life? Someone stepped out of the shadows behind a rock. Who but Hubert? At first, but only at first. I seem to have come just in time, he said. Yes, you certainly did, I said. Why aren't you at home at nights, fam? He said. And you, I thought, for now I remembered who he was. What cunning treachery was to happen here in the mountains tonight? Oh, why should it be a traitor who had saved me? Why must I be grateful to you, but of all people, not just for the meat, but also for my whole dear life? What are you doing here by yourself up here in the middle of the night? I said surlily. Shooting wolves, as you can see, said Hubert. Actually... I saw you when you rode away this morning and I thought perhaps I'd see that nothing dangerous happened to you, so I followed. Yes, lie away you, I thought, 
Sooner or later, you'll have Sophia to deal with, and then I'll be sorry for you. Where's Jonathan? said Hubert. He who's supposed to be out hunting wolves should have been here to shoot a few. I looked around. The wolves had disappeared. Every one of them, they had probably been frightened when the leader wolf had fallen dead, and perhaps they were grieving, for I heard plaintive little howls far away in the mountains. Well, where's Jonathan? persisted Hubert, and then I had to lie as well. Ah, uh, he's coming soon, I said. He went after a wolf pack over there, I said, pointing up the mountain. Hubert grinned. <laughs> he didn't believe me, I could see that. Shouldn't you perhaps come back with me? Home to Cherry Valley all the same, he said. No, I must wait for Jonathan, I said. He'll be here any minute now. Oh, yes, said Hubert. Oh, yes, he said, looking strangely at me. And then, then he drew out the knife he had in his belt. And I let out a little cry. What was he going to do? As he stood there in the moonlight with his knife in his hand he frightened me more than all the wolves in the mountains put together he wants my death went through my head he knows that i know that he's the traitor so he's followed me and now he wants to kill me i began to shake i was that brave don't do it don't do it i cried don't do it don't do what said hubert don't kill me i cried then Hubert turned white with rage and he rushed at me, coming so close that I almost fell backwards. I was so scared. You little scamp! What are you saying? He grabbed me by my hair and shook me. You little, little silly dolt, he said. If I had wanted to see you dead, I could have left you to that wolf. He held the knife right under my nose and it was a sharp knife, I could see that. I use this to skin wolves, he said, not to kill stupid kids. I got such a kick in the backside that I fell on my face, and then he set about skinning the wolf, swearing all the time as he did so. I hurried to Mount Fiala, for I wanted to get away from this place. Ooh, I, how I wanted to get away so badly. Where are you off to? shouted Hubert. I think I'll go and meet Jonathan, I said, and I could hear how scared and feeble I sounded. Yes, you do that, you oaf, shouted Hubert. Just go and kill yourself. I won't stop you any longer. But by then I was already riding away at full speed, and I could ignore Hubert. In front of me in the moonlight, the path wound its way further up the mountain. Gentle moonlight it was, almost like daylight, so that you could see everything. What luck! Otherwise, I would have been lost. It was like riding in a dream, for here were precipices and chasms which made you giddy. How terrible and how beautiful it was at the same time. It was like riding in a dream. That moonlight landscape could only exist in some lovely, wild dream, I thought, and I said to Fiala, What do you think is, who do you think is dreaming it? Not me. There must be someone else who has been able to dream up something so unnaturally terrible and beautiful. Perhaps it was God. But I was so tired and sleepy that I could hardly stay in the saddle. I would have to rest somewhere for the night. Preferably where there aren't any wolves, I said to Fjallar, and I think he agreed to that. Who then had tramped up the mountain paths between Nangiala's valleys from the beginning? Who had thought out how this path to Wildrose Valley should go? Was it necessary to let it curve its way along such miserable little rocky outcrops beside such terrible precipices? I knew that if Fiala as much as put one foot wrong, then we would both hurtle down into the depths. And then no one in an eternity of eternities would know what had happened to Carl Lionheart and his horse. It got worse and worse. In the end, I didn't dare keep my eyes open, because if we were going to plunge down in the abyss, then I didn't want to see it. But Fjalla didn't put a foot wrong. He managed. And when I eventually dared to look up again, we had come to a little glade.
a fine green glade which had the high, high mountains on one side and a steep precipice on the other. This is the place, I said. Here, Fjallar, here we are safe from the wolves. It was true. No wolf could be climbing down from the mountains as they were too high, and no wolf could come climbing out of the depths as the cliffs were too steep. If he were to come, the wolf, then he would have to make his path, like us, along the precipices on that wretched path, but they were probably not that cunning, I decided. Then I saw something really good. There was a deep cleft right in the mountainside, a cave, you could almost call it, because there were great blocks of rock as a roof. In that cave we could sleep safely, with a roof over our heads as well. Someone had rested in this glade before me, because there were ashes from left, from left from a campfire. I almost felt like lightning one, but I hadn't the energy. Now I only wanted to sleep, so I took Fjallar by the reins and I led him into the cave. It was a deep cave, and I said to Fjallar, there is room for 15 like you here. He whinnied, uh, he whinnied a little. Perhaps he was homesick for his stable. I asked his forgiveness for dragging him into this kind of hardship and I gave him some oats and I said good night to him again. And then I rolled myself up in my blanket in the furthest, darkest corner of the cave and I fell asleep like a log. Before I had even time to scare myself, I don't know how long I had been asleep, but suddenly I sat up and was quite wide awake. I heard voices, and I heard horses whinnying outside my cave. It was enough. The great wild terror swept over me again. Who knows, perhaps those people talking there were worse than wolves. Drive the horses into the cave and then we'll have more room, I heard a voice say and then two horses clattered in sight. They whinnied when they noticed Fjallar, and Fjallar whinnied back. But then they were quiet, and they must have become friends in the darkness. The people outside couldn't have realized that it was a strange horse that they had heard, as they calmly went on talking to each other. Why had they come? Who were they? What were they doing up in the mountains at night? I would have to find out. I was so scared that my teeth clattered and I wished myself a thousand miles away. But I was there, and quite near me were some people who might be friends, but who might just as well be enemies. And I would have to find out which, however terrified I was. So I lay down flat on my stomach and began to crawl towards the voices out there. The moon was right in the cave entrance, and a ray of moonlight fell straight down onto my hiding place, but I kept in the dark at the side, and wriggled slowly, slowly nearer to the voices. They were sitting out in the moonlight and were building a fire. Two men with coarse faces and black helmets on their heads. It was the first time I had seen any of Tangle's soldiers. And I knew what it was that I was looking at. That was certain. I knew that here I had two of those cruel men who had joined Tangle to destroy the green valleys of Nangiala. I didn't want to fall into their hands. I would rather have a wolf take me. They were talking quietly to each other, but inside in the darkness I was so close to them that I could hear every word. They seemed to be angry with someone, for one of them said, I'll hack his ears off. If he doesn't come in time this time, I'll hack his ears off. And then the other man said, Yes, he's got to learn. We have to sit here waiting in vain night after night. What use is he anyhow? Shooting carrier pigeons? Ha, that's all right. But Tangle wants more than that. He wants Sophia in Cutlack Heaven. And if this man can't fix that, it'll be the worse of him. And then I realized that the man they were talking about and whom they were waiting for was Hubert. Calm down a bit, I thought. Just wait until he's finished skinning the wolf, and he'll come, believe you me, and then he'll appear here over the path, the man who can catch Sophia for you. I burned with shame. I was ashamed that we had a traitor in Cherry Valley, and yet I wanted to see him come. Yes, because now, at last, I would have proof. It was one thing to suspect someone, but now I would know for certain so that I could say to Sophia, 
that Hubert, get rid of him. Otherwise, it'll soon be the end for you and the whole of Cherry Valley. How horrible it was waiting when there was something horrible to wait for. A traitor is something really horrible. I felt that so that my whole body crawled with it as I lie there. I almost stopped being afraid of the men by the fire because of that awful thing that I was soon to see the traitor coming on his horse just where the path came round the cliff. I was terrified at the thought and yet I couldn't stop staring so that my ass smatted towards the place where I knew he would appear. The two men out by the fire were staring in the same direction. They also knew which way he would come, but none of us knew when. We waited. They waited by the fire. I waited flat on my face by the cave. The moon moved away from the cave entrance, but time that stood still. Nothing happened. We just waited and waited until I longed to jump up and shout to put an end to it. It was as if everything was waiting. The moon, the mountains round about us, as if the whole terrible moonlight night, moonlit night, was holding its breath, waiting for the traitor. But at last he came, far away on the path, right in the middle of the moonlight, a rider on his horse was approaching. I knew I had him exactly where I knew where he would appear and I shuddered when I saw him. Hubert, how could you, I thought. My eyes were glinching and smarting so that I could, so that I had to close, so that I had to close them. Or perhaps I closed them so that I, so that I shouldn't see. I had waited so long for this wretch and now that he was actually coming, it was as if I couldn't bear to see his face. So I closed my eyes and just heard the clump of the horse's hoofs that he was approaching. At last he arrived. At last he arrived and reined in his horse. And then I opened my eyes because I had to see what a traitor looked like as he betrayed his own kind. Yes, I wanted to see Hubert as he came to betray Cherry Valley and everyone who lived there. But it wasn't Hubert. It was Jossie, the golden cockerel. Who would have thought that? I, I didn't see that coming, did you? I thought Jossie, the golden cockerel, was a friend. Mm. We're going to find out tomorrow what's going to happen next. If Jossie is truly the traitor or if, or if that something else is going to happen, I'm not sure. I see that uh, Miss Shin has joined us. Hello, Mrs. Shin. Thank you for watching us. I know that you've got quite a few of your lovely children watching us as well. And I can see that Ava is there. She's always live. That's nice. And there's two other people watching as well. So I say hello to whoever you are. Um, I can see that there is no more comments, no more questions, no more things. So I'm just going to say have a really good night. Tomorrow it's Saturday, it's still the holidays, but I haven't got anything else to do. So I will just be here again at five o'clock reading you the next chapter. Okay? Have a good night. Kakite no.